Uh, next talk is Matt Hendricks. Oh, no, there it is. All trial characteristics of moons in the solar system. My pleasure. So we're going to go back to space. <laughs> and um, we've heard this morning about ultraviolet spectroscopy of planets and Dr. Barth's contributions to that field. Here we're talking about moons. And uh, one of his biggest contributions was the detection and discovery of Jupiter's moon Ganymede's exosphere, hydrogen exosphere, uh, that you can see here in the upper plot. There we go. Um, and this was detected using the Galileo UVS and was followed on by imaging um, measurements from HST by, for instance, Paul Feldman that sh um, confirmed the hydrogen distribution and also showed the oxygen distribution and the oxygen uh, aurora that Ganymede exhibits. Um, so this is interesting and important, but that's all I'm going to say about atmospheres, actually, because I'm going to focus on surfaces. Um, and it's an area I've gone that's been slightly different than what um, Dr. Barth has focused on, but um, there's a lot you can do in studying surfaces in the UV. And I got into this by um, joining the Galileo UVS team as a grad student and studying Earth's moon. Um, possibly because nobody else on the team really wanted to look at the moon and the, <laughs> the UV, but I, I jumped on board and said, I'll do it. Um, so this is uh, circa 1995, here's the team. Um, it's scary to say that that was 20 years ago, <laughs> but there you have it. <laughs> so uh, for my thesis work, I, I um, worked on Galileo observations of the moon. And since then, um, as a postdoc, uh, worked on the icy moons. And uh, one of the things that we learned about was Ganymede's ozone absorption. Uh, here's the um, 260 nanometer absorption by ozone in ice. This is not in the atmosphere, it's in the icy surface, actually. Um, and along those lines, what we also found at Europa and at Ganymede was the signature of hydrogen peroxide in the UV. And um, as we heard about earlier, uh, in Mars's atmosphere, we have ozone, and we have the destruction of ozone by odd hydrogen. And so what we found um, is a very similar type of process happening on Ganymede, uh, but in the ice. Same type of uh, chemistry, though. So that was something that I thought was interesting and um, interesting tie to Dr. Barth's earlier work. Uh, since then, um, I have focused a lot on data from Cassini Ubis. This is in the Saturn system, studying the icy moons of Saturn. And um, as many of you know, uh, here's the moons of Saturn orbiting uh, outside the main rings of Saturn, but within uh, the outermost ring, which is the E ring. And this is a broad, tenuous, um, ring here that extends uh, clear out from the outer edge of the main rings out through out to the orbit of Titan at 20 RS. Um, and we know that the broadest part of that E ring is centered on Enceladus. Here's Enceladus that many of you uh, are probably aware of is active. It has um, geyser-like plumes at the South Pole, even though it's a very small body. And it uh, supplies water to the system. And it's actually the source of that E ring. Um, some of, besides producing water, it produces a lot of other, uh, more trace constituents. One of them being NH3, ammonia, in very small amounts, uh, only about 1%, and some other species too, but I'll get back to ammonia in a second. Oh, here's Enceladus contributing to the E-ring, okay? Again, a tiny, tiny moon. But, and here's the densest part of the E-ring here in Enceladus actually producing material, water ice particles and, and making that E-ring actually. So when we look at um, Enceladus in the far ultraviolet, we want to understand what uh, we can learn about the surface composition of Enceladus in that wavelength range. Um, we know that Enceladus from looking in the visible and in the near IR is made of uh, at least the surface, is practically pure H2O. So we see uh, water ice bands in the near IR telling us it's practically pure H2O. A very um, bland and flat spectrum in the visible, just like water ice is. But when we look in um, the far ultraviolet, 
we get a spectrum like this here, where we see that it's bright at wavelengths longward of about 165 nanometers. There's a very strong drop off, and then it's pretty dark shortward of that. And this is very typical of water ice. Okay, so again, it looks like water ice in the far UV. However, when we compare with a model of water ice, um, which is shown right here, we can see that although Enceladus displays the water ice absorption edge, it's a lot darker than pure water ice would be. So we need to understand what else is on the surface of Enceladus uh, that makes it dark um, compared to water ice. Um, here's another way of looking at this. If we make a composite spectrum of Enceladus from the IR clear down to the UV, you can see again these water ice absorption it, um, features in the IR, and we see that there's a big drop off from the visible uh, through the near UV into the far UV. Um, not, that's not water ice, okay? So we need to know what that is, and um, we know it's not water ice, but it's got to be something that's uh, bright in the visible and uh, featureless in the visible, and pretty featureless in the um, near IR, and a good candidate is NH3, because that ammonia is featureless throughout the viz and pretty featureless through the near IR, but it's got a very strong absorption edge right at about 200 nanometers, right where we need it to be to explain that f um, FUV darkness of Enceladus. Um, and it's such a strong absorption that we don't need very much of it to do the job that we need it to. Um, so what we think is that um, that plume, gas, is getting distributed onto the surface of Enceladus and it um, displays itself then in the, in the, um, in the UV to Vis um, spectrum. This is also supported by um, HST data that show, uh, that um, cover in the NUV, the big drop off and then the water ice edge um, absorption from, from uh, Cassini. So, so we think that we only need about 1% of um, NH3 to, to provide the uh, absorption that we need. So since Enceladus and all the rest of the moons are orbiting Saturn within that E-ring, which is made up of plume um, particles, that perhaps we should see NH3 or some other uh, plume species on the surfaces of those other moons. And so that's something that we're continuing to pursue, both with Cassini UVIS data and with HST studies. So my next quick topic is about Earth's moon. So we're back to studying Earth's moon um, since Galileo using Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and there's a UV instrument on LRO called the Lyman Alpha Mapping Project. And we all know now that there's water on the moon now. And um, so we can study that water using the FUV signature of the moon. Here's LAMP, it's a nadir, mostly nadir pointed uh, far UV spectrograph. And because there's this really strong water absorption edge in the far UV, we can use that to study water on the moon and the way that we do this is to um, look at the spectral signature right at 165 nanometers, right where that water um, is really strongly absorbing. So what we do is we measure the spectral slope right over that absorption edge and then in a longer wavelength band pass there. And we measure those slopes over the whole entire moon and at different times of day and see um, whether we see any uh, variability there. And it turns out that we do. These are, these are busy plots here, but the idea is that on the left here, these are the spectral slopes over that water absorption edge. And we see a lot of variability throughout the day. See, it's low, it, um, at beta angle zero, that's at about noon, and the slopes are getting very low. Okay, that means that there's not a lot of water there. But at, uh, early in the day and late in the day, the slope gets higher, redder, or stronger, indicating that uh, water could be present there um, at those colder temperatures. Um, whereas this really messy plot here is the um, uh, this, uh, spectral slopes at that longer wavelength um, where we don't expect water to contribute, and we don't see any time of day uh, correlation there. It's just a mess. So this uh, gives us more confidence in this 
shape here where there are uh, more water seems to contribute uh, earlier and later in the day uh, where temperatures are cooler. So uh, this is my final slide. I'll close there and um, take any questions and thank you. And I'd also like to just um, express my gratitude to Dr. Barth for getting me into UV spectroscopy and also for allowing me the um, independence and flexibility to kind of go in a slightly different direction. So thank you. Right. I'm sure that they have. Um, and did you mention sulfur? That's what I mainly think of as the sulfurous stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, sulfur is, is the energy source from which these you know, organisms. So I'm trying to see if there's a way of doing an inventory of different material absorption characteristics and then relating that you know, possibly down the road with what we encountered in this. Oh, I see. Well, that's an interesting idea. I don't know if there's necessarily the same types of components avail or um, present there, though, because we've, we're um, thinking about carbon-rich, uh, nitrogen-rich, perhaps, um, species at Enceladus. Um, so I think not necessarily the same as at the ocean floor, but maybe somebody else is better equipped to answer that. <laughs> so the CDA doesn't see very much sulfur. Right. Uh, but there could be hydrothermal effects at the bottom of the Enceladus ocean, including serpentinization, which could produce methane, which is uh, potentially seen by the uh, uh, neutral mass spectrometer.